Uh, two early German semi-automatic handguns. Um, they're both lock breech, short stroke, recoil operated guns. We'll do this one later. Today we're going to look at two things. Um, how this works, uh, how to recover from someone's attempt to blew it. Yeah, down the rabbit hole, let's go straw us a trigger. Well, we're back on the bench again. We were given this Luger to um, conserve, refurb, and get the owner out of the previous acts of other people that didn't really understand what we're trying to do here. This gun has been hot dip blue, and I'm gonna tell you what, it's horrible, and I'll show it to you up close here in a little bit. The trigger has been cold blued. I don't know what somebody tried to do. They tried to match the match some color. I have no idea. Um, the, the grips are repop. Um, it's, it's a mutt. But here's the important thing they didn't do with this gun. After you hot dip blue something, whether you polish it, not polish it, whatever, you've got to kill the action of the salts. It's got to be neutralized and then they've got to bleed out. We'll get on the up close here and I'm going to show you where when we got up inside this gun, it, it was scrody. Here, let's take a look at a, let's take a look at a piece here. That's a lot of oil on top of a lot of rust. And what happened was the gun rusted. It looked clean on the outside, but on the inside, the whole thing was orange. Now, I wish I could show you more of that. However, I would tell you that Casey's first impression when he pulled the gun apart, other than going, ah, was to clean it. He stopped it right off the bat. So we didn't get a lot of it. We don't hold guns here in a highly corroded state for two months so we can make an anvil out of them. Don't be ridiculous. So let's take a look at the trigger. The trigger has been kind of, I don't know here, um, cold blued. It's the wrong color for a trigger. It's just wrong. It's, um, I don't know how to even begin to describe to you what this thing looks like. We're gonna straw this. I'm gonna talk about temper coloring this to get that, to get that look everybody wants. It's a hot process. I'll show it to you. Um, I'm not going to claim that I'm all that in a soup sandwich, but this thing here we need to turn yellow. Here's the real crime. Okay. Everything has been polished to within an inch of its life on this thing. And as I roll this over, yeah, it's blue, but wow, it had a lot of pits. It just, I mean, everything on this gun got polished to within an inch of its life. Screws on World War I guns aren't this shiny. This is not oil or wax. This is a hot dip. And while this may be an appropriate finish on, you know, a 1950s Sears, Ted Williams, whatever, it doesn't look right on, on a 1917 issue Luger, as you can see the, the date right there, what hasn't had the crap polished off of it. And I've got some theories as to why. On the back of this frame, I don't know if we can see all of the cratering here. See all that cratering? I'm gonna get the light just right. You see that cratering? So I got a funny feeling that this thing was dug up underneath a bed or underneath some railroad tracks or the bilge of a submarine. And it had just nastiness all over it that got buffed out. And then it was thrown in a hot blue tank in order to turn it blue. So you can see all of the sharp edges on this thing have been rounded off. All of the sharp edges are gone off of it. There's no definition. I'm not going to be able to save that but what we're gonna do is strip this glitzy blue off of it. After we're sure that it works, we're gonna strip this glitzy blue off it. We're gonna use chemicals. I'm not even gonna sandblast this thing because I don't wanna take the remainder of it. So as you see here, let me get that light shining right there on the word safety. All of this has been 
just polished out. It's all washed out right here. You can see pits that are washed out. And from my research on this, I could be right or I could be wrong. The only letters on this gun that were ever white is right here, the word safety. I don't know if that, that red shouldn't be there. That I think is a modern aftermarket. The word safety was white so that you could read it. All of the other white letters that you see on these guns were there because 1950s collectors were highlighting the letters with white china markers so they would show up on a black and white photograph for other collectors. We take any remaining off, we take any remaining uh, colors off and with no, uh, with, with no regrets. So again, I'm gonna show you here, funneled out. You see where it's funneled. You can see where the polishing wheel was running this way and the polishing wheel just scoop 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 it just took it right out gadzooks i'm in my modern gunsmithing book here by clyde baker but this table's in a lot of different books um i've told you guys a couple of times which ones to look at there are various temp temperatures that you get the color effect when you get something hot what we're going to do to this trigger we're not going to make it a particularly deep we're not doing anything to it. We're just, we're just putting a temper color on it. So in our particular case, we want to go somewhere between this straw and dark straw. So somewhere between 460 and 470 degrees. Now, these numbers are based upon someone else's thermometer in the 1930s. My thermometer is traceable its accuracy is traceable to the floor i'm standing on so you just got to remember that so somewhere between the 470 460 degree place when we get into this tub of hot salts this now i polished it out silver all the color is gone now i just took it up to silver we're going to straw this thing back and pray that i can convey to you in this camera in this lighting setup the color of this we may very well show it to you outside so let's get out there and, uh, and, and go take a look. I've got the salts tank boiling. There's lots of heat in this potassium nitrate. We'll talk about that when we get out there, but that's why we gotta go outside. This is a tank of hot potassium nitrate. It is currently at just at the top end of the 400s. Um, it's about 480 degrees or so. This is the temperature that I have determined works about the best. You're gonna hear automobiles and trucks going by. There's a reason for that. Um, there's no way we're gonna do this inside the building. Now, do you need this much saltpeter heated up to do this? No. However, this is my tank. This is the one I use. You can do entire frames. When we go back in, I'm gonna show you something that was done in here in a little bit more heat. What we're doing here is a complete conductive heat transfer setup, okay? This is not an application, this is not a coat. We are using the molten potassium nitrate as a heat transfer medium. So what we'll do here is I'm now gonna slide this out of the way so that we can see what's going on here. Now this will just let this sit and it's not very, um, it's not very sexy to watch. However, and you have to balance your heat input from the burner with your heat losses to ambient. And remember, this thing is at almost 500 degrees in the ambient, let's say it's 100. There's a 400 degree delta T between this tank and the surrounding environment. So this thing bleeds energy like mad. It takes like a half a bottle of propane to heat it up, and I don't do it very often because the finish you get isn't that good. But we will allow this to actually get a temper color See, it hasn't started turning yet, so we've got to allow it to just sit there and get hot. Remember what I said before, the temperature in the book and the temperature on this thermometer versus the one the table was written on are different. So you've got to remember, it's an apples to oranges thing, and just make sure um, you, you just, you have to, the wisdom is knowledge tempered with experience. Just go with that. That's starting to turn yellow. It's very light. There it is. 
Now, I don't know how well the camera's conveying it, but this thing has turned a nice, dark straw. We'll try to get it under better conditions, but that's really all there is to it. It's just an immersion process. So we're back in now, and I've got this lit in a way I think you can see that that's yellow. We're going to have to take this outside and take a B-roll shot of it out in the sun because you can't see how iridescent the blue of this is. This is what happens when you heat the tank up another 100 degrees. And what I'm trying to show you here is the difference between how shiny and glitzy this, um, this hot dip is versus this almost iridescent bluish black of something that's been slow rust blued. This is the uh, trigger guard, the, the lever loop off of the 1886 uh, Winchester that we did a while back. And it's, it's back apart again to have one more thing done to the inside of it. So I figured I'd use it. So I just wanted to show you the differences. Um, it's, we're going to knock the shine off this thing and make it look a little bit, um, a little bit better here. Let's move on to how the firing control group works. Those other parts are in the damp box. They're going to go ahead and rust, get frog haired up. We'll get those blued. I'll bring them back here in a little bit. We've got other ambles on how to heck the blue stuff. We don't need that here. So I'll try to do this with my fingers here. My finger, uh, how the heck am I even going to describe this? This is so screwed up. Okay. When you pull down on the trigger, it does this. This takes this rod and does that. That rod does this. The back end of this picks up and it goes over the top. I don't even know how the heck to describe this. There's a lot of places in here. If you get slop on this pin, oops. If you get slop on this pin, if you get slop on this pin, if this gets bent, if that gets worn, if this spring gets worn out, if this surface right here doesn't want to trap the sear, if that sear surface gets worn, if the spring is worn, there's a lot of stuff going whir, bang, and piff, last thing. Since we're pushing in, boy, I don't even know if I've even got all the angles right on this. It's like this, I'm sorry. All that's tucked up underneath. If we push in on this, this comes out to touch the gun off. Well, what the safety does is comes up over the top of this and blocks that piece from rotating. So when the safety is on, this piece is up and you are theoretically unable to trip the caulking piece. I've saved you guys the gory details of watching me re-blue this. I've got the frame to a believable spot. I honestly believe that the steel had been impregnated with some kind of petroleum buffing compound. I don't know, but this thing was a flaming pain in the neck, but we've got a believable layer of rust blue on it. And it looks like a hundred year old weapon that was not beat up too bad. Not the table lamp in a French whorehouse. And that's what we don't want to have happen here. Okay, I've got the frame locked in and I wanted to show a couple of things. We had the trigger part that pulled down and that hook right there is going to pull down on the piece and cause it to pivot like this. That's this piece right here. We've already shown all this, but I'm just showing you how it goes together. That pivot right there is going to stick inside that slot and is going to push down on this piece and when it pushes on this piece right here do you hear that cluck that was the firing pin coming back forward again now when this thing goes back in the battery like this the important part to note is that this spring-loaded plunger right here it now departs the slide you see so the bar that pushed down on that is this comes forward that is going to push in so then when you release the trigger that snaps back up over the top and it's ready for the next evolution to drop it again. Now, if you don't want to drop it, you have it on safe. And when you put it on safe, this bar pops up and prevents the back end of this bar from kicking up. So safe just prevents that right there. So that was all the stuff we talked about before. I just wanted to go ahead and show it to you on the gun. Okay, so we'll cock. We'll come back and we'll take the takedown lever off. This piece slides in a, in a groove back here, drops into place, that kicks up, locks it all down. And then theoretically, when you pull all up on this, it's supposed to drop the hammer and it does. Bang, it's got a heavy duty trigger pull. Other latent features, magazine into the well here. We're just making sure we're free to go and it snaps in with a leaf spring that's held in there and the stocks do a lot of work on this.
they hold all of this stuff from falling out and they drop in now this was repop wood it was replacement wood here and i'm just making sure that i don't mess anything up there okay that's down all of that is held in with a now non glitzy screw that looks a lot nicer when this gun came in here there were lock washers up underneath this i don't understand that we're about to find out why and it's because i think that the mortise for this this grip screw was too big there you go now that's hanging on we're golden we'll flip over and grab the other side same deal that sits in there now what I'll probably do when the cameras are off is I'll do a very discreet acro glassing up underneath this to give these a little bit more shims but um, the white hardware store lock washers guys if you got one of these things in your gun it was probably put there but it doesn't belong there it just 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 no don't do that so I'm gonna come down I'm gonna grab that and there we go and then the last thing I want to check is when the mag follower comes all the way up to the top this should hang open for you allow you to drop a mag reinsert another one and drop it we should probably go shoot this thing and see whether it works now we've been up inside the fire control group so we've got to do a disconnector check first and then we'll do a mag check and see whether or not it runs or not so as usual two rounds because we're checking disconnector operation and we just want to make sure that we don't get any uh, 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 surprises here. Okay, that's good. We'll go for a full mag next. All right, so to disconnect the groove, we're gonna do full mag use now and see what we can come up with. Pull the toggle back to release and shoot. And we got good lock back. And that's what we're looking for, guys. Another old school piece of World War I kit brought back from the dead. We got rid of the French whorehouse looking hot dip blue. We went in with some rust blue. And I'm going to tell you what, me and this particular weapon have got about 150 to 200 rounds of retest ammo in my immediate future. And it's always a pleasure.